Okay, welcome back. So this will be the third video of our Active Recall High Yield Information Associations. So we'll pick up where we left off. So we left off on hyperaldosteronism. Um, so continuing along, what is Pick's disease? So Pick's disease, what are those? That is frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia will have intravenous inclusions in Pick bodies. So frontotemporal dementia, that's that early onset dementia in like the 50s and 60s, where the patients typically have hyperorality and um, just odd behaviors. So what does xanthrochromia make you think of? Xanthrochromia. Xanthrochromia is a yellow CSF from hemolysis. So a yellow CSF from hemolysis is xanthrochromia, and that should make you think of subarachnoid hemorrhage or subarachnoid bleed. And remember the diagnostic algorithm for subarachnoid hemorrhage, where we need to get an LP if it's not visible on the initial CT. So that's why we get this yellow CSF from hemolysis, the xanthrochromia. That's after we did a CT and it was not evident, so we did an LP, and we can find that on LP. So what is a Hampton's hump? Peripheral wedge-shaped consolidation or a shadow of the pleural space. How about the, also the Western mark sign, which is a decreased pulmonary vascular markings on chest x-ray. So Hampton's hump and um, Western mark sign, what does that make, make you think of? That would be pulmonary embolism. And what is our EKG finding that's most common on pulmonary embolism? That would be sinus tack. But what's the most patho pathognomonic sign for PE? That's the S1Q3T3 sign on the EKG. So how about bilious vomiting and abdominal distension in a newborn? So bilious vomiting and abdominal distension in a newborn. So that's not pyloric stenosis because it's bilious vomiting. So this would be duodenal atresia. So the, the lack of formation of the duodenum. So bilious vomiting and abdominal distension in the newborn. So what does Lofgren syndrome make you think of? Lofgren syndrome, hilar adenopathy, arthritis, as well as lupus pernio, erythema nodosum, which is on the shins, and, ace, and an ASIN um, angiotensin converting enzyme increase overall is found in this condition as well. So all these are signs of sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis, an autoimmune condition, will have Lofgren syndrome, hilar adenopathy, arthritis, lupus pernio, erythema nodosum, and also an ACE increase in sarcoidosis. So what does thumb printing of the bowel make you think of? Thumb printing of the bowel. So that'd be ischemic bowel. And how about METs from a GI tumor? Where would you find those? METs from a GI tumor. You could find them in the supraclavicular nodes, which is also called Virchow's node. So Virchow's node is the supraclavicular lymph node swelling, and that's from metastasis from a gastric tumor or other GI tumor. So what's the pathogen responsible for tuberculosis? That's, of course, mycobacterium tuberculosis. And what pathogen is associated with if you're going on a picnic, you're eating chicken salad or foods containing mayo, what kind of food poisoning or what kind of bug would you suspect would be causing that food poisoning? So that'd be staph aureus or staphylococcal food poisoning. If you have a patient with a significantly elevated hematocrit, what is your initial thought? So a significantly elevated hematocrit, that would be polycythemia vera. And also the treatment for polycythemia vera would be what? It would be therapeutic phlebotomy serially. So many times you'll have to do therapeutic phlebotomy. And these patients will often have itching um, after the shower and be very flushed. So polycythemia vera, therapeutic phlebotomy, and they'll have a significantly elevated hematocrit. So how about a stocking glove paresthesia? What do you think about stocking glove paresthesias? Maybe this patient also has a loss of position sense, a loss of fine touch and vibratory sense. What vitamin deficiency 
you might expect. So vitamin B12 deficiency. And also the stocking glove paresthesias you could see in diabetic neuropathy as well. So what's the most common cause of death in patients with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? So the most common cause of death in a patient with hokum, uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is actually V-fib. So sudden death from V-fib in hokum. And what are our treatments of hokum? We want to slow the heart down. We want to keep them hydrated. So beta blockers, definitively we can do alcohol septal ablation for those patients. So what would you think if your patient has a high alk -fos, They also have bone and joint pain. You want to consider if they have a high alk -fos and bone and joint pain, you want to think Paget's disease of the bone. So again, Paget's disease of the bone, first line treatment is what? is bisphosphonates, and that's that increase in osteoblasts and clasts, increasing the bone turnover, um, building it up and breaking it down. So they have a lot of bone, but it'll be very weak. So that'll be Paget's disease of the bone, high alk -fos, bone pain, treatments, bisphosphonates. So vegans or vegetarians, what are they at risk of? Like we just said, vitamin B12. And also actually sooner could be folate although everything's fortified now. Peaked T waves, this is an easy one. When do we see peaked T waves on EKG? So we see peaked T waves in hyperkalemia. We can also see hyper, okay, when do we see hyperacute T waves? So when do we see hyperacute T waves? That's the first sign of a STEMI. So hyperacute T waves is the first sign of a STEMI, and then the ST segment elevation, and then after we see the pathologic Q waves. So, but peak T waves is hyper K. What does pica make you think of? So pica is the eating of objects that are basically not food. So a common one is ice. It could also be like soil or metals and stuff like that. That makes you think of iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia for pica. And what are some other findings of iron deficiency anemia? Dizziness, lightheadedness, pallor, maybe some angular colitis on the um, edges of the, of the lips. What is the syndrome in a diabetic when they have um, hypoglycemic? When they have hypoglycemia and then they have a response with hyperglycemia. And how is that different from the other syndrome? So that's the Samagi syndrome. So they have a nocturnal hypoglycemia. In their response, they have a morning hyperglycemia to respond. So Somagi, S-O, hypoglycemia, H-O. So nocturnal hypoglycemia is Somagi. So in a patient, if they present with a progressive proximal, proximal muscle weakness, meaning the hips or the shoulders or the core. So proximal muscle weakness, difficulty climbing stairs and brushing the hair, and importantly, an elevated CK, creatinine kinase, or aldolase. What diagnosis does that make you think of? Makes you think of polymyositis as opposed to polymyalgia rheumatica. Because polymyalgia rheumatica does not have an elevated CK or an elevated aldolase. So this is polio polymyositis. And this will have the what kind of antibodies? This will have the anti-Jo antibodies. So how I remember that is myositis, anti-Jo antibodies. And also remember polymyalgia rheumatica, the one that's pretty similar, is a having a 50% association with what condition? That'd be giant cell temporal arteritis. So hypocalcemia is associated with what finding on EKG? So for hypocalcemia, you'll see a prolonged QT interval. So a prolonged QT interval in hypocalcemia. And for multiple myeloma, what are we going to find on radiograph? So multiple myeloma, which we discussed earlier, what are you going to find on radiograph? These will be punched out lytic lesions found on radiograph in the axial skeleton. So typically in the spine. So punched out radiographic 
lytic lesions in the spine, multiple myeloma. And remember, multiple myeloma, Benz-Jones proteins, the Rouleau formation, the M proteins as well. Okay, what do we see if we have a referred left shoulder pain? What's that called? A referred left shoulder pain. That would be Kerr's sign, and that's from a splenic rupture or anything that irritates the peritoneum up to the diaphragm. So that's the phrenic nerve that um, courses behind the lungs and up. So that's the Kerr sign, referred left shoulder pain, which is the phrenic nerve irritation in the peritoneum. And that's typically from a splenic rupture. So Kerr sign, splenic rupture, referred left shoulder pain. And we remember the other shoulder pain is Boa's sign, so remember Boa's sign for cholecystitis. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. What is the most common cause of, or, or what is the cause of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? What bug? So Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, the um, cause is Rickettsia rickettsii. So Rickettsia rickettsii, and that's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And what is the treatment for Rickettsia rickettsii, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever? That's doxycycline. It's doxycycline even in kids. So even in kids, it's doxycycline, doxycycline for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. However, in Lyme's disease, the best treatment is doxycycline, but not if they're kids. So if they're kids in Lyme's disease, you want to give them oxycillin, which I believe is either under eight. I believe it's under eight years old for doxycycline. That cannot be given in Lyme's disease in which you give amoxicillin. But Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, it's more serious, I guess. So you just give doxycycline no matter what. And that's Rickettsia rickettsii. And for Lyme's disease, what's the name of the bug? For Lyme's disease, the name of the bug is Borrelia burgdorferi. So Borrelia burgdorferi for Lyme's disease. And what's rubella? How's rubella different from rubiola? So rubella... Rubella is German measles, and what we'll see in this patient with rubella, how does the rash look in the patient with rubella, German measles? It'll be a rash starting in the face and spreading downwards, caudally. So it'll be cephalocaudal spread, rash starting on the face and spreading downwards in rubella. And rubiola is regular measles. Sausage finger appearance. So when you hear sausage finger appearance, what, what does that make you think of? Sausage finger appearance. So sausage finger appearance is psoriatic arthritis. What else is associated with psoriatic arthritis? HLA B27 positivity, seronegative spondyl arthropathy, definitely, and pencil and cup deformity. So also pencil and cup deformity, and also nail changes too. So for psoriatic arthritis, they can have all those things, sausage finger appearance, pencil and cup deformity, and nail changes. What if you have a patient with a sausage-like mass on abdominal radio radiography in, ch in a child? So a sausage-like mass on abdominal radiography in a child, intussusception. So that's intussusception. And what's the treatment for intussusception in a child? Treatment of intussusception in a child is a pneumatic enema. And should they go home after this treatment or should they stay inpatient? They should stay because there's a high rate of recurrence. So even after you use the air enema, there's a high rate of recurrence for intussusception. And again, sausage-like mass on abdominal radiography in a child is intussusception. So what is a complication following a DNC? dilation and curatage. What is a complication? So the endometrium could be scarred and classically that's called Asherman syndrome. So Asherman syndrome is a post DNC scarring of the endometrium. So Asherman syndrome, post um, DNC scarring of the endometrium. What are the clinical findings in TTP? Thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, is your mnemonic fat RN. F-A-T-R-N. So fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal abnormalities, and neurologic abnormalities. So FAT-RN for TTP. 
TTP, fat RN. What are our EKG findings for hypercalcemia? So EKG findings for hypercalcemia, shortened QT interval. So that'll be a shortened QT interval for hypercalcemia. What is our Virchow's triad? So what's the Virchow's triad? This is like extremely high yield. Virchow's triad is she, stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury. So Virchow's triad, stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury. And we also had Virchow's node, which is METS from the GI tract, supraclavicularly. So stasis, hypercoagulability, and endothelial injury is Virchow's triad. So what is the progression on the EKG as we progress to STEMI? What do we see first, middle, and then after? So the EKG progression to a STEMI is first hypercute T waves, hypercute T wave changes, ST elevation, and then Q waves. So pathologic Q waves are what remains. What would we think of with subcutaneous nodules over the extensor surfaces? So subcutaneous nodules over the extensor surfaces. That would be RA, rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis, subcutaneous nodules over the extensor surfaces. So what is syphilis treatment? So what is the treatment for syphilis? So remember syphilis Syphilis is treponema pallidum. What is the treatment and what's the common reaction after that? So syphilis treatment and what's the common reaction after that? So the treatment for syphilis is benzanthine penicillin G, 2.4 million units IM. And remember how the treatment differs from a primary syphilis to a secondary to a tertiary as well. And neurosyphilis gets a boatload more um, penicillin G than this. And the classic reaction is the Jarish. Herxheimer reaction. So they look like they're having a fever or toxic looking. An important clinical point is that they could be having a rash, fever, and toxic looking after you give them this penicillin, and you might confuse this with a penicillin allergy. So you might think they actually have an allergy to penicillin. However, they're really just having the Jarish Herxheimer reaction. So that's the lysis of the spirochete that's releasing all those toxins and the body's responding with a fever and making them look toxic. So you think they're more sick. However, you really just treated them with the penicillin and it just lysed all the um, treponemas. So what's the test for myasthenia gravis if you wanna make a quick diagnosis? So a patient comes in and you're suspecting myasthenia gravis. What's the test for a quick diagnosis? You can do the Tensilon or edrophonium test. So the tensilon or edrophonium test. So this is a quick test in which you just basically give them acetylcholine. Through, actually, you give them an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, so inhibiting the breakdown of the acetylcholine. So you give them that, and they should improve rapidly, and then it goes away quickly. So that's similar to the what other test can you give rapidly for myasthenia gravis? the ice pack test. So you can give, you can do the ice pack test or the tensilon edrophonium test. So you're in, increasing the amount of acetylcholine, which should improve them quickly. And then you can see that, yes, this actually does help them and make that diagnosis of a myasthenia gravis. And what surgery should myasthenic, should patients with myasthenia gravis have? So what, sh what surgery should patients with myasthenia gravis have? Patients with myasthenia gravis should have a thymectomy, a thymectomy, removal of the thymus gland. What are four symptoms that we see in patients with Parkinson's? So symptoms in patients with Parkinson's. Typically, we have the bigger three, which are in Parkinson's, tremor, rigidity, akinesia or bradykinesia, and postural disturbances. So of course the pill rolling tremor, the gait disturbances, the instability, the shuffling gait, the, um, also the glabellar reflex. What is the glabellar? <laughs> what is the glabellar reflex? What is the glabellar reflex? Is tapping but on the bridge of the nose, basically like here in this picture, basically tapping here 
and they're going to have rapid blinking. So that's the hook bladder reflex in Parkinsonism. What is the treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia? So what is the treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia? Treatment for gonorrhea and chlamydia is the same thing. Ceftriaxone IM 500. And also now doxycycline instead of azithromycin. <clears throat> so doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days as opposed to azithromycin because uh, azithromycin has poor coverage if you have mm, anal gonorrhea and chlamydia as well. So we do doxycycline for the better coverage and it's more effective now. So we give doxycycline over azithromycin. And again, they sometimes ask about the dose as well. So ceftriaxone is 500 IM once and the doxycycline is 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. So what is a fungus that is found in the soil that is infested with bird and bat droppings? And it's also transmitted by inhalation. And also it's in the Mississippi, Mississippi and Ohio River, River Valley. So Mississippi and Ohio River Valley, bird and bat droppings, and it's a fungus transmitted by inhalation. So this is probably from the palm unit. That's histoplasmosis. So histoplasmosis. So what is an inherited condition affecting all aspects of the lungs? It also affects the liver and sometimes the skin as well. And this leads to a panlobular or panacinar emphysema as opposed to a um, central emphysema, let's say. This is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, so deficiency in the liver's ability to make alpha-1 antitrypsin leads to the, so alpha-1 antitrypsin would typically decrease the breakdown of the lung tissue itself, the breakdown of the elastase in the lungs. So without it, we're just going to have massive just lysis of the cells we need in the lungs all over the lungs. So if they have emphysema at a young age, and it's across the whole entire lung since it's a systemic uh, deficiency as opposed to smoking resulting in emphysema just from the areas that are closest to the bronchi because that's where the smoke comes in then you would think alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency so what is an acquired demyelinating neuropathy often preceded by a viral infection and bacterial sometimes Acquired demyelinating neuropathy, often preceded by a viral infection. It has ascending weakness and a loss of DTRs. However, sensation is intact. So acquired demyelinating neuropathy, preceded by a viral or bacterial infection. Ascending weakness, loss of DTRs, and intact sensation, that's GBS, Guillain-Barre syndrome. So how I remember it is four A's, it's ascending, a reflexic antecedent event, that which would be a viral or um, infection, and we see that um, albuno, albuno, albumino cytologic dissociation. That's what we see. An albumino cytologic dissociation is where we actually in the CSF don't see any white blood cells. So neuromuscular disorder caused by autoantibodies to acetylcholine receptors, which we talked about. So what is that? That's going to be myasthenia gravis. And where do we see the symptoms? In the bulbar muscles and the extraocular muscles as well. So another neuromuscular syndrome, syndrome associated with small cell cancer, small cell lung carcinoma. So small cell lung carcinoma in a neuromuscular disorder, what does that make you think of? LEMS. Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, so LEMS for small cell carcinoma and neuromuscular disorder as well. And what perineoplastic phenomenon is not associated with small cell lung cancer? That would be the Pankos tumor in that squamous cell. All the other ones are associated with small cell, however, because small cell is really close in midline in the bronchi, so it's affecting things leading to like superior vena cava syndrome, blocking that off, um, ectopic production of ACTH secreting tumors, and of course, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome as well.
So what will we see in labs with testicular cancer, especially non sematomatous testicular cancer? So what will we see on labs with non sematomatous seminomatous testicular cancer? Increases in alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG. So increases in alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG not only make you think of testicular cancer, but non sematomatous testicular cancer. So how I remember it is non sematomatous is a longer word and it has way more things associated with it. So it has alpha fetoprotein and beta HCG associated with it. What is the gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary embolism? So gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary embolism. So gold standard for diagnosing pulmonary embolism is actually pulmonary angiography, not a helical CT. So helical CT is a really good test, but technically the gold standard for PE is a pulmonary angiography. So what's the most common cause of osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients? I just had a question on this one. Osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients. So osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients is specifically salmonella. So salmonella is the cause of osteomyelitis in sickle cell patients. And we just mentioned this one. What cancer is associated with a pancoast tumor? So what cancer is associated with a pancoast tumor? And where is the pancoast tumor located? So cancer associated with pancoast tumor and location of pancoast tumor. Pancoast tumor is associated with squamous cell carcinoma, and you remember the mnemonic CCCP. And pancoast tumor is an apical tumor, kind of underneath the shoulder in the lungs that can lead to many different things like an ulnar neuropathy and further metastasis as well. So what is the most common type of lung cancer that's associated with non-smokers and also women? So lung cancer associated with women and non-smokers, what is the most common cause of that? So non-smokers, it's important to know, adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinoma is the most common lung cancer associated with non-smokers. So what do we see in squamous cell carcinoma? Squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is a scaling patch or plaque. It's typically a skin lesion that's sharply demarcated with a scaling patch or plaque in squamous cell carcinoma. So name this thing, the exanthem that is pathognomonic for measles and typically occurs 48 hours before the characteristic xanthem. So occurs before 48 hours before the characteristic xanthem. That's coplic spots typically found in the tongue is those white spots in the tongue and in the buccal mucosa. What do you automatically think of for tibial tubercle pain? So if they have pain on the tibial tubercle, especially in a child or in a maybe eight to 13 year old, tibial tubercle pain in a child, maybe like eight to 13 years old, Osgood slaughter disease. So Osgood slaughter disease is an apophysitis of that tibial tubercle that leads to recurrent pain with activity. What's the most common cause or what is the cause of tinea versicolor? So tinea versicolor is a yeast organism. What's the most common cause of that? So tinea versicolor most common cause is a malassezia fervor yeast. So malassezia fervor for tinea versicolor. Most common cause of syphilis, or what is the cause of syphilis, rather? So what is the cause of syphilis is treponema pallidum. So treponema pallidum. And what, again, is the reaction after we treat them to the lysis of this spirochete? That's the jarish herxheimer reaction due to the penicillin lysing all those spirochetes. What is the atopic triad? What is the atopic triad? So the atopic triad is asthma, eczema, or atopic dermatitis, and seasonal, allerg seasonal rhinitis or allergic rhinitis. So asthma, eczema, and seasonal rhinitis or allergic rhinitis. How about the Samter's triad? 
What is the Sampras triad? That's also asthma, but also nasal polyps and aspirin sensitivity. So asthma, nasal polyps, and aspirin sensitivity. And as I said somewhere else for Sampras triad, it's SA, Sampras triad, SA. So we can remember it's AS, Sampras, nasal polyps, AS again, and um, aspirin sensitivity, AS. So asthma, aspirin sensitivity, and nasal polyps for Sampras triad. What is the tumor marker that monitors and detects ovarian cancer? So what's the tumor marker that monitors and detects ovarian cancer? That's going to be CA-125. However, remember that we don't just screen people with CA-125. This can be something that we follow the disease after they have it, but we never really screen with CA-125 for ovarian cancer, but it is associated with ovarian cancer. And what's the tumor marker associated with GI cancers, especially colon cancer? So that'll be CEA. And what's the tumor marker associated with pancreatic cancer? Tumor marker associated with pancreatic cancer is CA199. And we kind of went over this before. What is the treatment of myasthenia gravis? So treatment of myasthenia gravis, we want to increase the acetylcholine. So acetylcholine S, so acetylcholine esterase inhibitors inhibit the breakdown of acetylcholine in the synapse. So that would be like physostigmine, peridostigmine. Any of the stigmines are helpful. And what is another, what is another condition in which we can use the stigmines as well? What is another condition we can use the increase in ACH? That will be Ogilvy syndrome, which is a pseudo obstruction in the colon. So Ogilvy syndrome, a pseudo obstruction in the colon. So that's, we can also use acetylcholine esterase inhibitors for that. So treatment of myasthenia gravis, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors, and of course, plasmapheresis, very important. And also, like we said, a thymectomy. So plasmapheresis, thymectomy. And a very important one here. What is the type of tick responsible for transmitting Lyme disease? I get got this question many times on Rosh. What is the type of tick responsible for transmitting Lyme disease? So it's the Ixodes tick, I-X-O-D-E-S. So the Ixodes tick is responsible for transmitting Lyme disease. And this is a deer tick, not a dog tick. So the question asked, patient was in the woods, you know, classic presentation for Lyme disease, and they were around dogs. And I picked Lyme disease, and it was wrong because... The deer tick is Lyme's disease. A dog tick would be Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So interesting. So Exodes tick for Lyme's disease. So when would we? What were? What are our EKG findings on hypok? So hypokalemia. What are our EKG findings? So hypokalemia. What are our EKG findings? That's going to be a U wave. So U wave for hypokalemia. Is the EKG findings. So if a patient has a, on labs you get it back and they have a visceral pleural line, a visceral pleural line. So what is a visceral pleural line? Makes you think of pneumothorax. So a line, an extra line around the viscera of the lungs makes you think of pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. What is the name of the abnormality with lithium? So lithium teratogenicity, the abnormality is Epstein's anomaly. So Epstein's anomaly or Epstein's abnormality is a heart condition and that's why lithium is teratogenic. So what antibiotic would you give a febrile child with sickle cell anemia? So what antibiotic could you give a febrile child with sickle cell anemia? Ceftriaxone. We could give them ceftriaxone. And <clears throat> what is the infection risk after a splenectomy? So what's the problem with doing a splenectomy and infection? So patients are at risk for encapsulated organisms.
So after a splenectomy, which is, could be done in sickle cell patients, infection risk is for encapsulated organisms. So like strep pneumonia, Klebsiella, Haemophilus influenza. So infection risk after splenectomy. Encapsulated organisms like strep, Klebsiella, and H. flu. And treatment of absence seizures. So what is the treatment of absence seizures? That's important to know is ethosuximide. So ethosuximide is the first line treatment for absence seizures. And one last one we'll go for EKG findings associated with PE. So we have to know the importance of EKG findings associated with PE. So the most pathognomonic finding associated with PE would be the S1, Q3, T3 pattern. You could also see right axis deviation, but the most common is sinus tach, of course. So sinus tachycardia is the most common, but S1, Q3, T3 is the most specific. Okay, so we'll leave it there until the next video.